Field Education, a long title, Director of Backfield Education. Um, and we are so pleased to have Tori come speak with us today. Um, he's going to be, of course, talking about the uh, topic of school social work, and he talked about his new book, and um, I'm sure you're all going to be pleased with Tori. So please help me welcome Tori Cox. You know, I like being in the back. I don't know if you guys know, or maybe you know, I'm usually back there with Tiambe enjoying things, but um, Hortensia will tell you I enjoy a mic too, so uh, we'll have some fun today. Um, you know, I was thinking about how to how to kind of shape a presentation today that would be meaningful uh, to this audience, and I really love hearing everything that, uh, where everybody is situated, because um, this idea of interprofessional teams is really the way that we need to work with complex situations, not just in schools, but anywhere. And so, as I hear the, the, the Children's Center, you know, is mentioned, or, uh, or housing is mentioned, you know, there's all, all kinds of connections, and see you nodding, yes, all kinds of connections that we really need to make as school social workers, uh, mental health, of course. Um, so, uh, there should be a place for all of us to kind of have this connection. One of the things that I often say about school social work is, um, it's the place where all the problems of the world come to roost, or root, whatever it is. And because it is not a clinic specializing in a particular area. It is a place where all children come. And all children bring the challenges from their families with them. And so yes, there are some children that don't come, but pretty much all the challenges in our society come into the school. And so as a school social worker, you've got to have this really expansive, generalist approach to having a lot of knowledge, at least amount of knowledge about a lot of things. And so what I wanted, I guess, to share with you today is a little bit about what that school social, social work role is, how we can partner or be uh, in partnership with, uh, with you all and um, kind of build on some of my background and my experience in school social work and certainly what I'm uh, working on now. So I want to thank Paul for getting us set up with the clicker. Uh, I said to Paul, he was going to move the camera up. I said, I like to walk. He goes, I'll keep it back there. So um, I do invite questions, certainly comments as we move forward in this. I know our timing is, uh, is a little tight. I want to make sure we're out by 9.30. Um, just taking a quick look at the agenda, just describe my background a little bit and a little bit about this text. I'm going to pass it around. Um, it is really cool when people say uh, he has a book, you know, I've never seen <laughs> and uh, I never really thought that they would come. I'll, I'll qualify it slightly in a minute, but I'll go ahead and pass it around. Um, we're really proud of it. Um, we basically created the book um, to work in school social work classes in universities. The 16 chapters kind of correspond with weeks and stuff. I'll talk just briefly a little more about that. Um, we'll look at the uh, national social work practice model, school social work practice model, which kind of gives a flavor about how we uh, align our services, and certainly some of the roles in schools that we're working on. You know, one thing that you guys probably hear is that the jobs in five years, the jobs uh, that will be in five years have not been created yet. I'm sure there's something we hear a lot. I think in school social work, the roles also will be adjusting and adapting, which is kind of cool. We'll get into a little bit of the connection between Common Core and social emotional learning, and how school social workers can work in that area. Um, some law and ethics, and then uh, a vignette that will give an opportunity to kind of uh, think about what are different ways that you can bring your resources, your knowledge into, say, this vignette situation, which is based on a real situation in one of our partner high schools. Um, the objectives today are really to learn about the diversity of school social work roles, um, to, uh, to kind of figure out how to work within our professional teams, and then to maybe just learn a little bit more about your colleagues and building maybe a network of, of resources and support that you might be able to move forward with. Okay, so this is the text, uh, school, school Social Work National Perspectives on Practice in Schools. I was approached about five years ago by a colleague who said, you want to write a book? And when you work for a university, you kind of have to say yes. You know, and I'm like, yes, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, the, the book proposal is 130 pages. You know, so it's like you've almost written a book already just to propose and get accepted. But, um, what's cool about this is I'm an editor. So I'm not the primary author and, and neither are the other two. Uh, Leticia Villarreal Sosa and Michelle Alvarez. We are editors, so we did we did write some of the text, but we actually reviewed text coming from um, from other folks. And what we tried to do in setting up the book is to have a uh, a researcher, university person, and a practitioner co-write the chapters. So oftentimes books can be theoretical or cannot be grounded in any theory. So we try to combine that. So um, it's available on Amazon. Um, uh, Hortensia was like, how come we didn't bring books? By the way, Hortensia and I used to work together for like 13 years at Long Beach Unified, so if I refer to her, just so you know. Um, why don't you bring some books? Well, I'm still sort of 
a social order, which means you know we can't walk around with books like the doctors do sometimes. So you can go to Amazon, um, and so she goes, I'm going to bring it next time and you'll sign it. So no problem with that. I'll be, I'll be glad to do that if that seems like the right idea. So it's sixty-two dollars. So um, if that interests you, it's a it's a great text with a lot of great uh, great material in there. Okay, so uh, school social worker defined. Uh, certainly somebody with a degree in social work. Now in California, uh, and in most states, we can find it as someone with a master's degree. Um, but there are some states in the South, not to pick on the South, but there are some states that accept bachelor's degrees um, and allow them to work in that area. So uh, from a national perspective, we have to kind of message it carefully, but certainly we're about having a master's, a master's degree here. And by the way, school social workers are not always called school social workers in schools. They can be called behavior intervention specialists, they can be called uh, LCAP or LCFF coordinators. They can be called uh, intervention specialists. There's all sorts of things. And so the state of California keeps track of the title of school social worker, but it's always way underrepresented. So it comes out to around 435, 450 in the state of California, which is horrible. Chicago, well not Chicago, Illinois has 3,000. You know, and we're, we're, set, we're, we're huge. We're the seventh largest economy in the world as a state. You know, it's all these things that's really bad. But we are a little bit more representative when you look at other titles. Um, LA Unified, for example, has about 250 school social workers working as people services and attendance workers. So they work on attendance. Uh, and they have about 350 who work in school mental health. Now they're called uh, psychiatric social workers. So again, they don't appear on that number. So it's a little bit. Now you have Long Beach Unified, and I heard a familiar refrain there. Um, so let, let me just talk a little bit about, about my background. So, I, uh, I started, um, I, I was in Barbara's uh, seminar class back in 1994, uh, back when I was just a young pup, and then ended up getting the school social work. And in 1997, I started working at the Stevenson YMCA Community School. Now, you may know this, Stevenson Elementary down on Lyme and Sixth, but they have a community school, which has been going on for a long time. And it, it had YMCA influence, and then Cal State Long Beach uh, influence as well, through Julie O'Donnell. I did that for a year, built a nice program, and then I got hired um, by the school district and was a school social worker for 13 years. We had, a, at, the, at the top end, we had 13 school social workers. And for a district that had about 85 to 90,000 students, that's not really a good ratio, but in 2010, when the recession was in full force and I got my pink slip, uh, we went down to like two social workers. So two for 88,000, so you, it, it just, it's not really a priority. In, in Long Beach, unfortunately, and so um, sad to hear about this, a similar situation you're facing. So uh, I will talk about some good news around school social work. Um, anyways, I went, I, I was able to teach at Cal State Long Beach while I was working as a school social worker, and that allowed me to go to USC. And so I've been at USC since 2010. I served as president of the California Association of School Social Workers for three years, and served as the standards and practice chair for the School Social Work Association of America. So I kept my link with school social work throughout, and that's kind of what led to the book. And so really pleased about that work. Um, so as far as school social workers, we really are, uh, uh, we promote ourselves at the link between the home, the school, and the community. Uh, oftentimes schools can be so focused on curriculum or so focused on certain aspects, and when the student has struggles, it seems like really difficult to make any inroads into what's happening in the home. And so with school social workers, we really work on that aspect. It's one of those linkage areas that, unless you're in a school, sometimes it's hard to kind of think about how that, that plays out. Um, but we would basically have teachers come to us and just say, I'm so frustrated, I can't make a difference in what happens outside the classroom. And when they show up in the classroom, there's so many things I have to wade through before I can even start to teach. And so that's where we come into school social workers. Um, we're referred to in federal grants now as CISP. Um, it's part of this group called CISP, and that stands for Specialized Instructional Services Personnel. Or support, uh, support Personnel. And that's a new term to kind of uh, bring psychologists into and nurses and counselors kind of in this group of people who support the learning. And so you'll see that more often in federal grants. Um, and then as far as interprofessional teams, uh, we really do a lot of work in that. In fact, that's one of the links uh, that social workers, one of the roles that social workers play in general, but certainly in schools, we're interested in engaging with our community partners to bring whatever services are needed for an individual student, a group of students, or the school in general. And so that's kind of our, our linkage there. I listed a couple of things that I was involved with. University collaborations. We bring interns in. We have great collaborations in Long Beach. I have great collaborations, certainly with Cal State Long Beach, uh, Dominguez Hills, USC, UCLA, to bring in interns. 
And that just expanded those 13 school social workers and expanded our work by double or triple to get them out of the schools, and that was really crucial. Um, uh, certainly the site-based teams like SST, student success teams, student study teams, um, cost, uh, coordination of service teams, things of that nature are taking place at the site. Uh, we used to do home visits with public health nurses because they, they would have insights into what was taking place in some of our students. So we were doing these, these awesome kind of engagements out in the community and still are in, in various areas. And then uh, the Child Protective Services, which is you know, DCFS um, here, uh, they would have these, uh, these teams where you would meet to talk about the welfare of a student. And uh, it, the, the name's escaping me right now, but I'm sure some of you will, will pipe in on that. But um, we would basically get together and talk about uh, what would be the right outcome for a particular student. They had never received the school perspective. And frankly, if you work in schools or DCFS, we usually talk about, about each other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, how come they didn't take that report? DCFS says, well, how come they keep calling them the same thing? So we would call, <laughs> we would call about neglect, and they would say we're not going to take them, and, and so on and so forth. So we would have a lot of uh, challenges that way. So this was a way actually to come together to partner and to actually share resources. It's amazing what happens when you get in the same room with people. And this is the whole idea around being a professional team. Um, okay, so in terms of some of the systems of support for school social workers, uh, certainly in schools themselves, and I mentioned um, the pupil services and attendance and the school mental health, there are divisions within school districts that are supportive um, of our work and certainly advocating for that. The California Association of School Social Workers, a um, very a great group that provides support and linkages. I see a lot of job announcements coming through on that. In fact, recently just saw one from Napa Valley. And they wants to apply. You might have to move, but it might be worth it, yeah. um, And NESW is a strong partner with us. Um, they have developed some standards for school social work. Uh, they also have a code of ethics, which is really the grounding, uh, the foundational aspect of how we can make ethical decisions in schools um, and really as social workers. And so they're key. And then the, the School Social Work Association of America uh, is a, a large entity that has uh, conferences throughout the year, recently in San Diego, I think just last year. Um, and so they're a, a great support as well. Um, and they've developed this national practice model. So I thought I'd kind of go through this a little bit just to get a flavor of kind of how school social workers are working and what the emphasis are. Certainly, uh, if you look at the top, there's the homeschool. I was trying to see if there's a, a poem. Um, the homeschool uh, community linkages, which is a very, well, you see in the center of the students. That is our primary focus, and that is our ethical obligations to students. Um, certainly, as you move out and you're looking at other stakeholders, but students are the primary focus. Database decision making. Uh, in uh, human services in general, certainly in social work, that's been a bit of a journey to kind of begin to use data effectively and to kind of get out of the idea that the interaction, um, the client interaction, is where everything um, is, is located and everything needs to kind of do that. So stream from that. Having data, using it to make decisions is key so that you can increase your funding uh, through federal means or through state legislation. Um, certainly it's key. And also make decisions about clients and about students, about how you move forward with them. Um, with, uh, without knowing actually how they're doing, it's difficult to move forward. Ethical guidelines, educational rights, and advocacy. The right column, I'll kind of take a look at this next screen. It's kind of three different levels. Now you'll see a common theme throughout, and this it connects with the idea of interprofessional teams which is this idea of the triangle, the RTI, um, what we call multi-tiered uh, multi systems of support. So you'll see MTSS emerged as a, as a, as a term in a little bit. Um, but you see that they implement multi-tiered programs and practices. This is a, a lens for kind of looking at how school social workers provide service, and not just school social workers, but others as well. And so certainly, we kind of, our bread and butter, a sense, in a sense, is in our, um, in our direct practice with individuals and groups. And so uh, we have, in California, you have to earn what's called a PPS credential, stands for People Personnel Services Credential. And, uh, and that's basically something you can get at school, you can get as a postmaster's. And with that, then, um, you, you have to provide a certain amount of direct practice in order to get that credential. We have fought hard to try to get macro social work, to get, kind of get a macro social work experience uh, validated in, in PPS, but it hasn't really taken place so far. So mostly, that's kind of where our bread and butter is. But as you get in schools, of course, you understand that there are huge systems at work, and that, that you're just you're a small pond if you're just trying to correct one child at a time. So you have to get involved, 
And again, that's one of the beautiful things about school social work, this generalist idea, is it's not just direct practice, it's not just meso work or small group or, or targeted interventions, it's actually trying to change the system as well. And that's the beautiful thing about having interns, is they come in and they kind of remind you that you need to change the system <laughs> and you get kind of stuck in your way. So that's always been a joy to be reminded of that. Um, certainly promoting school cli climate and culture. And this idea of school climate and culture is how you kind of get into a little bit more of the meso and macro and larger systems, universal approaches to try to change the way schools operate and the way they interact with, with uh, uh, vulnerable uh, children, youth, and families. Um, and that's cert certainly something that um, that we, we have been able to articulate a little better with the multi-tiered systems of support um, than say before. Um, sometimes our funding is tied just to direct service. So if you're sometimes in a special ed um, situation or if you're in a mental health clinic, you kind of have to work in those areas. Um, and then uh, the idea of access to services is, is another component. Okay, so this is the multi-tiered systems of support model. This is one example of kind of what it would look like. And you can see on the left, uh, there's, there's an idea about how you approach it in academic systems, and then on the right, how you would approach it to students in behavioral systems, uh, behavioral um, difficulties. And so on the left, oftentimes it's referred to as RTI, which is called response to intervention, which is kind of a specific kind of model around academics. Um, but certainly, uh, we've combined the two with this multi-tier system of support. You can see that, that it looks at sort of how we should align our, our efforts that we should not just go in thinking we're just meeting individually with students or running groups. We should actually put a lot of our effort in to these universal uh, prevention efforts. And so those could be things like um, catching the good, you know, programs like that, uh, peer counseling, uh, programs you create in your school to where the students themselves are actually providing services. Um, it could be um, after school programming that addresses all the, all the children. Um, it could be a number of different things that relate to that. And so that's certainly. Um, where we want to put a lot of our efforts in, and that is a way of actually changing the culture and the climate of a school and ultimately a district. <laughs> if you think about the role that school social workers play, it's, it's many and varied. It's been defined as kind of six primary roles, but again, these things are changing as our society changes and certainly as the expectations for how we can with individuals change. And so if you look at the tier one, this again is just another way of looking at the, um, the multi-tier system of support. Um, most students are involved in that. I put U next to tier one, which just stands for universal. Another way of viewing it. Uh, tier two would be uh, targeted, and tier one would be intensive. And so it's just a way of thinking about how you align your services. Now what happens when they, uh, they look at school social workers across the country and do surveys, find that the majority of the work is done in which tier? Tier three, right. So it's, it's actually realigning, <clears throat> realigning the thinking. Now as, just coming from my own perspective, there's a sense of, um, there's an adrenaline rush when someone gets it in a therapy or engagement session, yeah, when you're like, oh man, that, that was amazing. And so sometimes in the universal approaches, that adrenaline rush is different. It's just not there at the same. And so we're kind of geared towards that. And schools are geared towards identifying individual students for their bad behavior. So you have these two things happening, and next thing you know, there you are. You have clients all day, and you've missed, you've missed all the things you should be doing in universal prevention or, or classroom interventions other things that, that address more students. And so these are realities of kind of the way our society is structured and how we have to kind of fight for a different perspective and a different way to view it. Um, so some of the things here, um, LCAP, LCFF, I'll get to in a little more detail later. That stands for the Local Control Accountability Plan, Local Control Funding Formula. The Local Control Funding Formula is the statewide California legislative legislation that basically ensured that a new way of funding would come to schools. It came in about 2013, and it was really terrific for school social workers because it targeted uh, English language learners, uh, students experiencing homelessness, those who were in foster youth and other special needs. And that's our, that's our population in many ways, the ones that we work with. So it led to a lot of hiring for school social workers. It was very exciting. Um, and so that's, those are more universal areas. But certainly uh, crisis intervention, uh, doing classroom interventions, and uh, using evidence-based practices. So evidence-based practices now are the norm in any real human service, and certainly in schools, that's, that's a trend. The challenge, of course, in schools is finding funding to purchase these evidence-based practice interventions. And so there's always this kind of push and pull between do you have resources to be able to bring them in, and uh, can you just provide you know, individual counseling, which may not have the, uh, the same sort of impact. Any questions about the multi-tiered systems of support model? Is this new? 
old, you know it, <laughs> been exposed to it. You'll see in, in various things that I'm talking about, there's, there's kind of this micro to macro sort of idea. You can just kind of see it here, you know, micro interventions at tier three, uh, all the way to kind of universal. That's, that's a common theme, I think, in school social work is that we can kind of move in these various areas. Um, okay. Social work and end of use Long Beach. So this is where I think about where, where, you know, where's my nexus? And I actually, I, I really love that Paula was like, come on, you gotta come, you gotta do this. And you got a book, I'm like, oh yeah, I got a book. Okay, so that's, that's what I do this. So just trying to, I was like, I'm kind of just find a way to maybe connect with you guys to say, here's, here's the relevance and here's how you guys can be thinking about these things. As you're working with, um, with your population, whatever your population is, you know, if they have children, you put a lot of people work with families, they're gonna be in schools and they're gonna be in there eight hours a day. And you know, what is their experience in those schools and what if you knew you had a resource in the school that you could collaborate with and you could provide holistic and, and wraparound interventions that included that time period during the day. Now, for parents, sometimes it's like, whew, our kids are gone for eight hours a day. Um, and so, but lots of things happen in schools. It's not just a static time for students, they actually are developing emotionally, they're developing where their place in the world, they're hearing a comment from a teacher and they're embedding it in their soul and they're going forward believing that's kind of who they are. And I think all of us can relate to these kind of ideas. I was told in fourth grade I couldn't draw. So uh, I can't draw, I just knew I couldn't. And then uh, when I was 25, I thought I'd try again. And so uh, that's a minor example. Many of us have been told much worse um, by, uh, by teachers or by folks in schools. And so we have to realize that goes on right now. And in schools, when you're dealing with children with problem behavior, oftentimes the, uh, the parent has also gone through a similar experience in schools where they actually have been victimized and they have not been supported. And so the easy thing to say from you know, the secretary or the vice principal or the principal is that parent just doesn't care about the kids. And as school social workers, we are there to advocate strongly that that is not the case at all that we need to look at the full range of experiences of what has happened and find the understanding and find a way to connect with the parent. And we try to do that as school social workers, try to make that connection to bridge those gaps. Um, okay, so looking at kind of this idea of uh, child abuse prevention. Now, you know, end of use long is child abuse prevention and, uh, and domestic violence prevention. So this idea of domestic violence prevention, I thought kind of might be a little difficult to kind of get to from a school angle, so I sort of included child abuse primarily. And then I got into the ESSA, which is the Every Student Succeeds Act. It's the new version of No Child Left Behind. And one of their key things they want to expand is violence prevention activities. So there actually is a lot of different connections here, and I'll get to that later. Uh, but this idea of, yes, do we report abuse and neglect when it comes to us in schools? Yes, we do. We're required, we're mandated reporters. But there's so much more that we look at in schools. And so I gave some, some flavor here to the ESSA. Um, the disciplinary practices, um, that have been going on in schools have been disproportionately targeted towards the minority youth. And so that is something that uh, there's been a uh, concerted effort to try to change that approach. But that gets into the underpinning of how the schools handle discipline, period. They have to really unearth all those things so we can advocate for those changes. The idea of disproportionality in special ed. Um, African American males have been disproportionately reflected in special ed. And so efforts to try to advocate for appropriate use of special ed. And it's often been in the emotionally disturbed category. So it's been like, we can't handle the behavior, and so we're gonna put it in here. And so traditionally this has been, you know, middle class white women teaching African American males, and the clash is there, and this is what happened, the disproportionately occurred lawsuits. And so we're there to try to, try to help and advocate for that, um, not necessarily be in the course of action. Now, special ed has been a, um, a pit of some nature that people go in and never come out. And so it has not been successful. For some students, it's very successful, let me just say that. But for a lot of the students, it's been a place to put bad behavior and not to be able to, to address that. And so we're finding these battles in schools um, to try to rectify that and certainly legal as well. Uh, the challenges of students who identify as LGBTQ, uh, providing safe zones, um, identifying yourself as allies um, in, that, uh, in those challenges. Looking at some of the, the laws, you know, there's the now transgender, Individuals can use the restroom of choice in schools, and that's like a huge thing in California, not around the country. And so these are ways that California is pushing things. And then this idea of social emotional learning, that outcomes actually, uh, academic outcomes are directly related to the ability for individuals to progress in their social emotional learning. I'll show you a model in just a little bit that is promoted by 
um, by a group from Chicago called Castle that looks at social emotional learning. And then what are the intervention points? So these SSTs, the, the, the student support teams, student success teams, we learn about students who are struggling and then provide interventions to them. Um, family trauma, you know, we learn about these things. You know, elementary schools have a very community-based feel. High schools, not so much. But sometimes we learn about things that are happening in families and then we're able to intervene and offer services. One of the, I'm just gonna say, one of the proudest moments in my career occurred at International Elementary School, which I think has been renamed. I think it's been renamed. Anyway, I went by it the other day. Um, and I was working with this mother who, interestingly enough, had three sets of, of biological twins. Wow. So it, I really quite don't need to say anything else. She's got a lot on her plate. And she, we usually kind of jokingly referred to her as Mount Vesuvius because we never knew when she was going to blow up. You know, and so, um, but then I started working with her. We got this great sense of connection with her. So I'm walking across the international playground and I hear this voice yelling across. That's my social worker. And I'm like, wow, oh, that's so cool. You know, because you just would never, that was her. You know, she was like, she was proud of the connection. So what we try to do in those situations is say, yes, you may hear the term social worker and think I'm here to take your kids. I'm not. I'm here to actually work on an intervention plan with you to try to overcome the obstacles that your children are facing. They're facing obstacles, but they're rooted in the home environment. And so these are powerful ways to communicate. Um, okay. This is, the, uh, um, this is the, kind of the model coming from Castle uh, around social emotional learning. And it basically takes a look at five different components of how uh, children develop. But I gotta tell you, we teach master's level students. What is the saying? Uh, I'm looking at them, uh, this is like a different kind of spectrum, right? So if you think about kind of the beginning, the beginning of this begins with self-awareness. If you think about your own development, how have you kind of developed your sense of social emotional learning throughout your life? This idea of self-awareness translates into self-management. So self-awareness is an individual process in a sense, and be aware of who you are. Self-management all of a sudden becomes, okay, how do I manage myself in relation to others? Then you move into uh, uh, social awareness, um, which is this idea of how do you group into a social uh, space, relationship skills, how do you build relationships with people, and then responsible decision making. And so I think about where are my students on the spectrum? Tw you know, 22 year olds, 30 year olds, 65 year olds, where are they on this? It's an interesting way to kind of look at it and how do you build up the skills for that? Um, what we've done in, uh, in, in the School Social Work Associates of America is created a, um, let me see if I can pull this up right now. Um, we've created a, a, basically a way to look at these different areas and to chart out kind of what Common Core has done. Common Core has set up national standards. Um, if you know anything about Common Core or don't, I'll just say they have national standards that at the end of the year, you should be able to meet these standards. They don't tell you how to get there. They just say this is what you should. So that's kind of what we've done. Oops, it doesn't show up there. Um, that's kind of what we've done here with this. I was trying to figure this out earlier. Oops. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yikes. All right, let's see if we can get this back. Okay, I, I may have to just uh, not, not do that anymore, so that's a, that's a good, uh, good thing to be aware of there. I wanted to kind of show you what that looked like, but basically we, we took a look at um, early, early elementary, middle, kind of late elementary, uh, middle school and high school, and looked at what should the children be able to do in each of these areas by the end. And now we use that as a way to help school social workers uh, have their, their interaction with children in groups um, be connected to uh, social emotional learning standards, but also connected to common core standards. And so it's a way to kind of combine these things. Because if we can say to teachers, the hour or the, the half an hour we're spending with this group of five kids is actually helping them meet common core standards, they're much more likely to let us in, 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 interact with them. So it's an important technique. Um, but you get the idea with, uh, um, with how these, these areas work. Okay, some key beliefs. Um, I think these are, I kind of pulled just a few that are interesting, I think, about uh, what kind of perspective we would come from as school social workers. Um, so the idea that our primary ethical responsibility is to students and secondary to all other stakeholders. And that may not be too surprising, but if you're in school, sometimes it doesn't really feel that way, that everybody may have the same perspective on that. And so parents are often, um, you know, in some schools are seen as sort of the primary stakeholder when they shouldn't be. Um, absent information to the contrary, um, we believe that parents act in the best interest of children. Now, this is an interesting construct because I think 
all of us know of interactions with parents where we feel like, wow, they're not really acting in the best interest of children. But what happens is people in schools have, and this is school social as well, have taken a bit of license sometimes to just say, oh, what the child's telling me is 100% true, so we're not going to involve the parent at all, and we're just going to exclude them from the process. And that has led to a lot of other challenges. Those of you who are parents can certainly relate to the idea that if your child's at school and getting services from a social worker and you know nothing about it, uh, that might be a little concerning. So the idea of involving the parents also speaks to this idea of the 24-7 influence that family has on an individual and community has on an individual. Oftentimes we spend an hour with someone and we think that's, that lasts in the week, but they've got all these other influences. If we can bring the community together actually in service of the child, then we'll be a lot better off. So that's where that belief comes from. And then the fact that we're educators as well as social workers. So there's the idea that there's an academic benefit and a behavioral, uh, emotional benefit as well to our work. Um, when it comes to some of the legal things that we, that we deal with in school social work, um, this kind of summarizes a little bit here that we're trying to balance the legal and, and rights of, of students. We're trying to uh, promote the well-being and also be aware of how parents should be involved. And so I think this kind of summarizes a little bit of the challenge that we're in. Schools are interesting because the primary, the, the referrer is next door. It doesn't happen in a lot of other entities, like the teacher's right next door. And they can see you in the lunchroom and say, tell me about, you know, James. And I can say, well, he's a great kid. And, you know, we have to teach our interns how to actually respond to those questions because there's a confidentiality piece involved there. So it's, it's incestuous in a sense. You just go all right there and it's like, wait a minute, I'm with the kid in my classroom, you know, six hours a day. You better tell me what's going on. So there's a lot of interesting components that take place in schools. And so being aware of all these areas is really important as a school social worker. Okay, just go, let's go to the case example. Um, this is just an example of a situation that I was involved in. And let's just kind of dialogue and have some process in this. So I'll go ahead and read these bullet points. You can read them along with. Um, and, and if you can read the information on your slides, don't go to the next slide. Okay. So um, one of my interns was working with a, a seventh grade uh, Latina. Um, who was age 13, admitted in, in interaction that she was getting drunk on the weekends. Told the intern getting drunk on the weekends. The information was held confidential by the intern. Uh, feeling confident, the seventh grader tells the nurse. The nurse went to the counselor. The counselor became alarmed, calls the parents. The parents come to the school. Now I give you enough information there to be able to Think about what happens next. I don't think you can, no, you, you can suddenly say. So what do you think happens next in this scenario? Let's give some examples. There's no wrong answer really, but just based on what you see up there, what, what, what might happen next? The hysterical parent comes to the school. The hysterical parent comes to school. Okay, thanks Mina. What else? Jessica. Parents possibly, this is a little messed up, but abuse child on campus. Okay, all right, yeah, possible. Yes. Student loses trust with the social worker and, mm. and or nurse. Mm. Yeah, so imagine losing trust with the social worker, the nurse, and the counselor. Talk about your system of support. Got like that, right? Yep, good. Other things? What else? Think about the family, think about the parents. You can chime in if you want to. Okay. <laughs> what, do you think, what do you think the parents, what's their take? Um, my experience has been, well, with this case, um, a couple of parents denied, oh, no, it's not my child, no, it's not. She's uh, not really not called from my house, she's doing fine, I don't yeah. know what you're talking about. Yeah. Just kind of like, don't mess with my speed, our speed up, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a uh, big possibility that if you need your being not telling the truth. Yeah. That's right. That's right. You, you can't actually, you can't witness that she's getting drunk. You hear the report. Yep. Good. All right. If your parents publicly deny it and privately say child abuse, in response and excessive punishment. Yeah. Yeah. So the counselor felt actually quite empowered to do what they were doing and uh, um, called me in, in anger. Why, why would you? Because I was in I was in contact with the intern. Why would you advise the interns to hold the information confidential? So I had to go through the ed code 
go through the code of ethics and explain exactly why this applies, not just to the intern, but to, to him as well. That children over the age of 12 have most of the rights of confidentiality of adults. And unless you witness something and witness the impairment, that this is held confidential. So here's what happens. The counselor using the 18-year-old daughter as the interpreter tells parents uh, what their child is doing. Seventh grader weeps as father hears the story. Father politely excuses family and disenrolls the child from the school. In this situation, she was out for three weeks from school and then popped up at another junior high in our district. So that's three weeks of lost instruction time. That's three key people that she's now lost connections with. Friends, all that is gone. So when I'm talking to the counselor, I'm fielding this negative and I'm reflecting back that actually this was done correctly. And it took him about two weeks until he called me back and apologized. But because in this scenario, he realized he overreacted. And when we went actually to the code, we actually were doing the right thing. This is a small example of some of the complex situations that we're involved with. And this kind of, in this scenario, you can think about what might be the structures of a family that would be described here that would support this kind of response. And you can see this could happen in all kinds of families. Certainly the idea of public embarrassment was huge here um, and how it was handled. So um, just a small example here uh, about how that kind of goes forward. Um, and for the intern then, she began on, you know, she was not very confident about what to do next should she encounter this again. So I had to continue to work with her on that. And then the relationship with her and the counselor at the school and, uh, and the nurse, because now there was this trail of, of kind of broken confidentiality. So, Really interesting case, and uh, ultimately in the end, we became faster friends, the counselor, but you know, we had this really rough patch. Um, so, not that that's the end goal, but. Okay, some relevant laws and policies. We're not gonna go through all these, obviously. I just want you to get a flavor of, when I say that school social workers are, have, to, have to have a lot of knowledge about a lot of things, here's an example. All these laws are relevant for what happens in schools. Because they're coming with, children are coming with all the things that are, uh, involved here. And this is only just a sample. Um, it was certainly the idea of uh, reauthorization of Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, the ESSA, FERPA. Uh, FERPA is kind of what guides our confidentiality for students, and it, it, it supersedes HIPAA in almost every situation except for a few at wellness clinics and things of that nature. Um, and so that's our guidance. The McKinney Vento Homeless Act that works with children who are uh, experiencing homelessness, so it has to be acknowledged about that. AB 490. Uh, deals with foster children and their right to, to remain at the school. Essentially, children who are experiencing homelessness, children who have mental health challenges, children who um, have been in foster care, they have the largest gaps in terms of continual uh, uh, enrollment in schools. And so these, these bills, like 490, are, are set to try to, to make sure they can stay wherever they're going to school. So that's a key thing about 490. If the foster child gets placed in their foster home, they can still go to their same school. And that's a key advocacy piece. And, but it does say in there that um, what's in the best interest of the child. So we had a student who was, in, who was in Long Beach, was going to Wilson High School. It was January of his senior year. January of his senior year. Gets shipped from one foster home to one in Pasadena. What's in the best interest of the child? To start going to school in Pasadena? He's got, he's got five months left. So the district paid for bus transportation and he came to Wilson for the remaining of the school year. So there's all decisions that can be made of 490 really help push us in that direction. May I add something with foster yes. care? So something interesting with foster care, sometimes we think it's the foster um, parent, maybe a, a different family, or maybe the grandmother or the uncle, but it could also be the parent. For example, if the dad and the mom separate and the dad was abuser and mom keeps the, the child, the mom never worked and she's struggling to survive or et cetera. So she becomes a positive parent and they assist her um, you know, from, from children's services. And that's something that um, it's good to keep in mind because sometimes we think that it's a different family or a different family member, but it could be the actual parent as well. Yeah, just thank you. You know, this, the stories from the field are always better than you can actually write, you know, you know make up. Um, I'm, I'm passing out a vignette right now for us to kind of, we'll move into it in a few slides. Um, that is a, a, a situation we dealt with in one of our high school um, outside of here. But I wanted to just um, hit a little bit on Every Student Succeeds Act. It just got passed last year. It's an important act 
because it, um, it actually expands certain services that we're passionate about as school social workers, but all of you are passionate about as human service providers. And so if you, if you look, there's an emphasis certainly on evidence-based intervention, um, reducing the discipline practices that we move students from the classroom, because lost instructional time is, is really what we're trying to, to get rid of, so students spend more time in class. Teachers can feel like that puts more onus on them to handle classroom management, classroom behavior, but it's the best way to work with children. Um, and then positive behavioral intervention supports, also known as PBIS, is a term you could hear in schools. And that's really around creating atmospheres of positive reinforcement of behavior in schools instead of just being about um, punishing negative behavior. And so there's different systems that can happen. What's cool about this is, is the Act talks about expanding access to counseling and mental health programs. Like it's actually written in the Act. It talks about trauma-informed and evidence-based school mental health services. We talk a lot in, in, in East Long Beach about trauma-informed services. And so now it's written in. Now it's written into uh, the law that should be expanded. Evidence-based drug and violence prevention programs, that those should be expanded as well. Uh, child sexual abuse awareness. Where's Paul? Paul, passionate about that. Um, and prevention programs, bullying and harassment prevention programs, and uh, training for school personnel and trauma-informed practices, and crisis management, conflict resolution, human trafficking, which relates to the big that I just passed out. Um, school-based violence prevention and bullying and harassment prevention. So all these things are actually in the new act that is being implemented this year for the first time. And so does that translate into services at the school level? Well, we hope. But certainly if it's written in federally, there's strong support from, from legislators to get it passed. And so uh, we were really excited to kind of see what, the, uh, um, what was included in that bill. Uh, this is just a brief, uh, brief summary of the uh, LCF draft of the LCAP. Uh, which I mentioned earlier, which is coming out of California. And uh, there are eight areas that focus on economically disadvantaged pupils, English language learners, foster youth, and individuals with exceptional needs. And in that, there were, there were three of those areas that we were particularly focused on um, that school social workers can particularly impact. Parental involvement, uh, pupil engagement, and school climate. Yes, Michael? Yeah, back to the um, Every Student Succeeds Act. Yes. Um, is there any key to that? There's teeth in it, but it might have braces, not the right amount. There's, there's, there's teeth in it. What I mean is it's written in, and school districts often find ways to say they're doing things. I mean, just like anything, that they're doing it, or maybe they are or they aren't. But there are fun, there's funding tied to actually following through on these, on these recommendations. And certainly, any grant programs that are coming out are going to reference these things. That's what's so important about this act, is it's going to last 10 to 15 years. You know, No Child Left Behind was a 15-year started in 2001 and finally you know, got changed in 2000. So it has long lasting implications. So all federal grants will reflect what's written in the act. And so any money that comes through those areas also will be tied to it. So I would say that you can certainly advocate in your schools that this is what we should be doing. And because uh, and, and it's written in the law. Thank you. And so in 2013, a lot of school districts started hiring. Long Be uh, LA Unified actually, they used to call us at USC and say, uh, we need some applicants. Which you gotta understand for somebody who was a 13 year school social worker who got laid off during the recession. You know, it's a bittersweet thing to hear. I'm just like, oh, couldn't you have called three years? No. But, you know, it's led to great things. But it's just one of those things that it's the ebb and flow sometimes of funding for school social work. And um, it's unfortunate, but certainly um, LCAP has led to a lot. Um, may, how many of you went to district information sessions when LCAP was rolling out in, uh, in 2013? Did any of you? I went to my local school district to talk about it, and every conceivable group was saying that they addressed these students. So there was a big librarian push. We need, we need more librarians. And thankfully, the state was pretty clear. It's like, no, we're actually talking about services directly to these individuals, these children, and, and their families who are struggling in these areas. And so we were able to advocate for a lot of positions. And I think the Napa Valley position kind of comes from this idea. Um, and we see a lot more school social work positions being um, around. Yes. You know, for LAUSD, it seemed like every single year we would always have to be um, advocating with the Board of Supervisors for whatever the program was that we wanted to have. And, you know, it was all a great program, but in the end there wasn't a lot of money, so a lot of them were cut. And in the end, they would come back around. Yeah. I, thought I thought you had your own theme music. I <laughs> <laughs> but it 
but it's uh, very interesting because now um, it feels like LAUSD, which used to come and go with the social workers, it just feels like that's the place to be. So this is Mina Montemayor. She, uh, she teaches uh, with us at USC, but also is a full-time school social worker at LUSD. So uh, thanks for the insight. Okay, so some of the unique dilemmas in schools have to do with some of the things I was talking about, the idea of confidentiality, and kind of how that works when people are right next to you and asking. And so what I would tell our interns and what I would do myself is talk about where we were going and not about where we've been. So I would say, is it true that the, that the mom is this? Is it true that, and I would just say, you know what, we're doing some great work with, with James and, and we're putting some great things in place and you could really support us in the classroom by doing this. And I just try to move in that direction. It was always challenging, um, certainly. Um, the idea of involuntary clients versus voluntary. You know, there's a discipline process in schools where you gotta go see the school social worker, and they don't wanna be there. So we're working on our skills there. So even though you're kind of in a captive audience, they don't have to talk, they don't have to do anything. So um, we are also written in as DIS counselors, that's designated instructional services, or, or providing DIS counseling services and IEPs. And again, that's, that's required as part of the IEP, so it depends on kind of where the clients are coming from, the students are coming from. And then this idea of the interprofessional approach, which kind of gets us to um, this, this last bit, which is on interprofessional teams. What I'd like for you to do is to kind of look around you and get a group of three or four. What I love is that there's people from all different you know, kind of walks of human services here. And read through the vignette together um, with, this, with this idea that um, school social workers should be part of interprofessional teams. What I'd love for you to do is think about what is your angle into this case? into the vignette that I just passed out. What, what kind of services or what kind of things could you in your current position bring in? And how might you be able to partner with a school social worker in this type of scenario? Now this took place in, uh, in one of our schools, uh, high schools in South LA that we actually partner with at USC. Their training, their effort is to train future social workers in this high school, which is pretty cool. But it means they deal with a lot of stuff and it's a tough area. This scenario happened actually at this school. so. Um, so what I'd like you to do is to is together in groups of three or four right now, kind of read through it and have a dialogue amongst each other, bringing your individual perspectives on where you're coming from. If you are with people who you work with, maybe consider moving in a different space uh, just to kind of uh, get a different flavor. And um, we'll do this for about what, five to ten minutes, and then we'll have some dialogue afterwards. Okay. Great. So let's let's hear from uh, from a, a group who would like to volunteer to just talk about what some of their dialogue was in this case and how the uh, the breadth of knowledge and experience in the team would come to be of assistance here. Julie? Um, we had a lot after going to Wow. Um, we talked about like initially the response creating like a safe space um, for both the girls so that there's an opportunity to maybe have place to talk to both of them, get them away from each other so that the fight can then continue, bringing in uh, the possibility of needing to bring in some kind of health assessment, a nurse, you know, you're going to have to bring in either DCFS or the police, you're going to have to assess whether not only, obviously, it's not safe for them to go back to where they came from, but where are they from? And do their parents know they're gone? Do their parents involved? Was there abuse in the home initially? So there's, it's just 
probably <laughs> this this red vignette is the literally the, the smallest tip of this huge expert. Oh, in this <laughs> um, but schools are the recruiting grounds now for yes. human traffickers. Um, and and they, I heard a comment made over here. You made a comment that these girls may be brought in by the pimp to recruit more girls, which is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. We'll have a yes or answer. I was just going to say that we have was real productive in thinking of like crisis intervention and doing things pretty immediately, like what the young lady was saying over there. However, we also started thinking about we have probably two hours in which to still intervene with all the people you observe. And we all know that in a high school, rumors, did you hear what happened? Before you know it, everyone's going to go home and the school is the most unsafe place. And if a media person gets it, we are in dead trouble. So you also have to look beyond that. You have to look at, okay, so what are we going to do to all the kids who observe? We still have two periods. Does the principal want to send the notice out? Um, you know, they have to consult with the district. I mean, there's just and there's so many things. And then Megan, who was my intern, it's such a pleasure to see her, um, brought up that whoever registered them had to fill out and qualify to be at that school district. Mm -hmm. So at least you have to verify who these people are, and maybe they did get false information, and that's a police issue. But then one other thing, Tori, sorry that it takes so much time, but when we were talking about 911 and calling the police, I just had to, um, to remind, or not remind, but I had to inform that large school districts have their own police, mm -hmm. and if it's not a 911 situation, which this might not be a 911 situation, we have to call school police. And, and I remember when I worked for LA Unified, LA Unified was the third largest police department in the state of California. That shocked me. You know? In this scenario, there's a, there's a school resource officer right yeah. there on campus. Right. So you guys are doing yeah, Thank so you so much. So there's so many systems things that you uh -huh. that. <laughs> Anywhere from the micro all the way to the micro. Yes, love to hear from probation. Yes. <laughs> so our, I mean, our thought was immediately we have to figure out um, before this so-called dad gets back to school, uh -huh. pick them up, immediately detained um, while they're trying to um, put the girls, comfort them and talk to them and kind of see what's going on so we can get as much information about, because we can't really just charge them with just hearing what they're saying, but they got to get enough information. They have to make the girls feel comfortable to tell them. So I said um, maybe an undercover detective that's mm -hmm. not dressed, talking to them, acting like she's comforting them and trying to get as much statement as she can, knowing, you know, how he picked them up. So basically, the other ones, because if it's just those two, it may be some more. But getting as much information and then basically arresting him and just kind of having him, um, you know, in the integra integration room as long as they can until they can um, get as much information. And then, like everyone else said, getting them, the girls in a safe place, which DCFS, we find that they don't take them. <laughs> so, I mean, and then we bring them into probation and hold them, but it's really against them to hold them there. But whatever needs to be done, if it was me, I would want to, you know, hold on to them just to make sure they're safe. I wouldn't want them to get back there. So whoever can get them. Yeah, so a couple things real quick. Certainly the laws in California have changed. Long Beach is huge. Anaheim has been huge at, at, at enforcing those laws that, that minors who are trafficked are seen as the victims and not as the perpetrators. And that's a huge shift. We've honored mm -hmm. folks here in Long Beach for that work, and that's been gigantic. So yes. that is a different approach with them, and certainly. But for the those who are being trafficked, they often don't see it from that same angle, and they're fighting to get back with their the life they know. So there's a lot of elements in place. Paul, so that's all I was going to say. Yeah. This to get to this point, these girls have been through so much. They probably have so many negative opinions of DCFS, police, social workers. They're probably not going to be so willing to talk against the court in this case. It was one of the things that we did. Yeah. And certainly we know that the wooing and the courting of a potential trafficking victim um, links some emotional content, emotional connection that can, that can lead to difficulty. Yes. We had a conversation about consulting with the Human Trafficking uh, Task Force mm -hmm. because as the expertise that they have, they can maybe 
come on board sure. to support this whole process because it is very complex. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I also mentioned that um, within the school system, having that line of communication open with the key people, the principals, the psychologist, counselor, to keep that confidentiality and those rumors, etc., um, out, out, out of line because even teachers are going to want to know. So far, a lot of teachers, oh, there was just another fight, but they don't know the details, they don't know everything, but um, the, the principal eventually will send an email to them. I so I heard about the story at USC. I mean, that's how that's how quickly it went. You know, I mean, it wasn't just so these things they do carry. Yes, we're out of time, and, and it just what I wanted to do today was expose you to the role of school social order, to recognize some of the complexity taking place in schools, to think about the idea of how you can connect with schools around the services of children, that they do have this contact with them consistently. I really appreciate the comments and the dialogue here, and I thank you so much for the time you spent with me today. Thanks. Thank you.